Hello! I thought I'd get started a minute early just to make sure everything's working. It's so good to see so many of you showing up. It's always fun to talk about decluttering, right? <laughs> if that's not what you thought, then we'll help change your mind. We're going to have a fun time talking about decluttering and getting on top of the stuff, but more importantly, getting on top of our attitude. So good to see so many of you here. And I'm just going to check out and see what some of these uh, answers to my question are. I don't know if you saw in the ask a question box where you can leave a question and I'll try to get to as many of those as I can. Um, I asked you what your biggest clutter struggle is. And you can see there with all the people answering that you're not alone. If it's your kitchen table that collects clutter, if you just have piles of stuff that's hard to stay on top of, boots and coats by the door, toys, the clutter always coming back, every flat surface collects clutter. This is just normal. <laughs> this is something that we all are experiencing when we have families at home and we actually live in our homes. You know, crazy. that It means stuff. And so we're going to talk about managing the stuff, which is really what decluttering boils down to. All right. <laughs> Yes, desks, any, it, it really is flat surfaces. These are the kind of places that just get out of hand so quickly. And that's what we're going to talk about today during this workshop. So I'm excited to um, talk about that with you today. And I even have slides. So let me get those going. You started off with some silent slides there for a bit, and I know that threw some of you off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, let's go back to the slides. There we go. All right, so this is Cut the Clutter Workshop, Enjoy Decluttering Workshop. I kind of went through a few names for it, but I realized yesterday, uh, doable decluttering needed to be the name. <laughs> so today we're going to learn the ABCs of doable decluttering. And I'm so glad that you have joined me for this. And here is how you know whether or not this workshop is for you. <laughs> Basically, it's if you have a home with a family, it's for you. And this is what our experience is at home with clutter. The house is a mess. You know, that's a part of clutter, stuff being everywhere. Uh, clutter tends to make us feel stuck because we don't know what to do with the stuff. It's like everywhere and I don't even know where to start or what to do with it. You feel stuck by the clutter. Decluttering seems like a never ending job. And that is the main thing that we're going to talk about today. It <laughs> not going to give that away. Uh, you can't get traction because you're always dealing with accumulated junk. So, so many of us, and you can raise your hand in the chat if you relate to this, but you have projects or organizing or cleaning that you'd really like to get to when you get on top of the stuff. But the stuff is getting in the way of other things that you might want to do. And so it seems like we need to get a handle on all the stuff first, but we can't seem to do that. And so we don't get on with the other projects that we would like to get to. That is, um, yes, <laughs> and yes, all four apply to most of us, right? 
Um, this is just, this is normal. So if this is you, I mean, this, this isn't the picture of normal that the magazines or the minimalists or the whatever portray. And so then we think, well, something must be wrong with me because that's never going to be possible. That, uh, you know, clear white space with a single potted plant is, is just never going to be my reality unless what I do is I move all of the junk out to some other room where it doesn't belong and just have a junk room where I've stuffed everything so that I could have my, you know, one nice side table <laughs> for the pictures. But when your home is lived in by a lot of people, by children who grow and change and, you know, need more and different things, then managing stuff simply is part of our responsibilities as homemakers. Managing that stuff and staying on top of it, whether it's, you know, keeping toys picked up and rotated when they're little because everything can't be out at once. So we just, you know, are doing our best to um, keep a manageable amount out and some other stuff put away, or it's clothes that need to go in and out of storage and that transition point where they're everywhere <laughs> because of seasons or because of size changes, because we don't just want to get rid of the stuff because we have someone you know, another younger child who's going to come up and need that at some point. Stuff management is just a part of our job as homemakers. So we can learn to get good at it. We can learn to appreciate it as part of our job and not feel like we're doing something wrong because we have stuff that we have to manage. And I think a lot of times the image that magazines and HDTV and Pinterest presents makes us think that we're doing something wrong because we have a bunch of stuff to manage. And that's not the case. We are doing our work and serving our family by being administrators of stuff. So we're going to do that well today. <laughs> Um, and yes, we're also going to talk about when it's other people's stuff, right? <laughs> okay, I gotta click the right spot. So what I would recommend you do during this workshop, I mean, unless you're busy decluttering while you listen, or maybe cooking dinner or folding laundry or whatever, if you are just sitting, then grab a pen and paper so that you can not take notes on what I'm saying, but write down the thoughts that come to you while you listen. And even if you are folding laundry or cooking dinner or decluttering, have a pen and paper handy because what I think is gonna happen as you listen is you are gonna think of your own ideas and things that you need to do or maybe... Uh, um, helpful takeaway thought that you're going to want to write down. So you don't need to take notes. I'm going to send the replay out and I'm going to send you the slide deck afterwards. So you don't need to write down what's on the slides or anything, but I want you to write down what comes to your mind. And that might be, these are places that I need to really tackle or, um, you know, this, these are wrong thoughts about clutter that I have that I need to address. I would love for you to have a notebook and pencil handy to brain dump while you listen, just to get out onto paper whatever pops to your mind, because when you get it out of your mind, then later you're able to think through the process and think through your situation more concretely, and it really helps you address your particular situation. And that's another thing that HGTV, magazines, Pinterest, all these kind of places make us feel, you know, intentionally or not, they make us feel like our situation should match theirs. 
and that what we need to do is arrange things to mimic what they have done. When what we are called to do as Christian homemakers is administer, manage, serve the, in the, the particular home and situation and the people that God has placed in our life. And that means that the situations and the needs differ. And so we need to be thinking through, you know, what matters for me and my family right now? And what do I need to be paying attention to in my particular situation right now? And the situations change. But right now, what do you need to be paying attention to or addressing in your home? Um, okay, so before we can really talk about decluttering, we have to talk about clutter. To, to declutter, what is what are we de- <laughs> doing? <laughs> what are we undoing? To declutter means to deal with clutter. So before we can declutter, we have to know what it is we're dealing with. And I think this is where a lot of our confusion happens because we have uh, maybe a different definition of clutter from other people in our home or a different functioning definition of clutter than the books and the magazines or the TV shows. Or maybe we just haven't ever thought about what clutter really is. And so we're decluttering and we're wondering why it feels so hard and confusing. And it might be because we don't have a clear handle on what clutter is. So then we can't handle it. So let's talk about what clutter is. Clutter is something that does not belong where it is right now. So something is in a place where it doesn't belong. That's all it takes to make it clutter. So clutter doesn't mean junk or trash or problem. It just means a thing that is where it does not belong. So a thing that is clutter in one place, like on top of the dryer or the dining room table or the random bookshelf shelf, isn't clutter if it's where it belongs. You know, So if it's a book on the bookshelf, it's not clutter. It's a thing that is where it belongs. But if it's a book on the dryer, then it's clutter because it's a thing taking up space in a place where it doesn't belong. So whether it's junk or treasure, it's clutter if it's not put away. So really to declutter is really just a fancy word for putting things away. <laughs> but it becomes a bigger project than that when we are dealing with things that don't have homes when what we actually have to do is not just put things away and tidy up, but actually decide whether or not these things belong in our homes in the first place or where they actually belong. Um, it is a decision, a situation fraught with decision fatigue potential. Um, it can be hard to figure out where something belongs in the first place. So to declutter, we need to give things homes. And so a part of that is going to mean... Um, putting things in the trash or taking things to goodwill or giving them to someone else, handing them down. They, they need to find a home outside of our home 
that's a big part of decluttering. But another part of it is just giving the things a home. And this is what we need to do when the clutter is really just someone else's treasure. It's junk to us, but it's treasure to someone else. That just means that it needs a home. And we need to, you know, honestly evaluate, is there space for it to have a home in our home? And if so, then we give it one. And then it has a home and it's no longer clutter. Even though it is in our home, it now has a place and it's in its place. So it's no longer clutter. And it really does boil down to just that. But because it's really about making those decisions, it is tiring and can be hard work. So let's talk about how to tackle decluttering as a project. And if you've been around me or simply convivial for a while, then you know that any kind of organizing, including decluttering, starts with your attitude. So we have to adjust our attitude first. And it's not just our attitude about the clutter itself, although that's part of it. We need to adjust our attitude about the process of decluttering as well. Our attitude really determines our approach to the, the project of decluttering. And we're going to talk about it as a project a little bit later. But um, we think that in order to deal with the clutter and get to decluttering, we just need a strategy for dealing with the clutter and then we'll be good to go. But in reality, yeah, it's our attitude that we need to deal with before we can deal with the stuff. And some of that is going to be just whining, <laughs> internal whining and complaining that we have to do it at all in the first place, or we're ungrateful for all the stuff that we do have, which is really a part of God's material blessing on us, but we are ungrateful and complaining about having to manage it. And some of it is just a bad attitude about other people and their stuff and their actions. And we think that if they would just do what they should do, I wouldn't have to have all this extra work. And it's not like there, there might be some grains of truth in that statement about other people dealing with their stuff. But the reality is that as homemakers and mothers and wives, dealing with the stuff really is part of our job description. Um, it, it is a normal part of our responsibilities that we can embrace and tackle without whining and complaining. So when we find whining and complaining in our attitude about decluttering, we need to address that first. We need to declutter our attitude. Uh, that's going to be more important and more effective in making our home a pleasant place than getting rid of stuff. You could get rid of all of the stuff, but if you kept the whiny and complaining attitude, your home would still not be a nice place to be. <laughs> if you have a cheerful, God-honoring, loving attitude in your home, then the piles are not getting going to get in the way of you loving your children and taking care of them and glorifying God in tackling the work that you have the time and calling to do at that time. Sometimes the work that God gives us means that there's not time to do the decluttering and take care of the piles and all of that. So we need to get our attitudes in the right place so that we can do the work that God has placed before us each day. Sometimes that's going to mean tackling the stuff. Sometimes that's going to mean letting it sit because we have more important work 
to do and we can't do it all. So, um, <laughs> it is easy to, to blame our attitude problems on other people and on stuff, but our attitude is our responsibility before God and getting rid of stuff is not an attitude solution. An attitude solution is repenting for ingratitude, repenting of complaining, repenting of impatience and a lack of kindness to the people around us. And when we start there, we can make real progress then and the decluttering will be helpful to everyone in our family. But, you know, mom decluttering in a huff is not going to make your home a nice place to be. And it's not going to change whatever you're doing, you're building. That is, those are the bricks that you are laying and um, the kind of house that you're establishing. So it's kind of like the proverb um, where um, the better a table of herbs where love is than a feast without love. That's a poor paraphrase, but you know the one I'm talking about. That's what we're talking about here. Better a house full of piles where love is than a minimal home with, with strife. So we can't go after the clutter with that strife, anger, frustration. If we tackle the clutter in frustration, then we're tearing down our home, not building it up. And we want to be wise women who build our homes. And we do that with our love, with kindness, with patience. These are the things that ought to mark our attitude as we tackle these projects. So we need to think about the real goal of our home and the goal of decluttering, and that might help us uh, address our own attitudes about it, because sometimes we see our home as an end in itself, something that in its own right ought to be this beautiful, perfect, peaceful, serene place when really the home doesn't matter so much. It's the people that matter. So your home is a place for people. Your home is a stage for life. And the stuff is the props on the stage. So, you know, you can picture a play going on and the props are every which way it, it gets in the way of the play moving forward, the action taking place. On the other hand, props in the right place at the right time help the action, help set the tone and communicate what's going on. So the stage manager is keeping track of what stuff needs to be where, when. And it's not really about the stuff. It's about helping that play happen well and, and communicate to the audience what we're trying to communicate. So in the same way, our home and the stuff is the stage and the props. And we need to be stage managers who don't care so much about the, the state of the stage or the props, but just about keeping the play moving, keep, make, helping that action move forward. And, and that's what really matters. So to do that, we go to step two. So the A of decluttering, decluttering, I guess, is the D. The A of decluttering is adjust your attitude, and the B is build better habits. We tend to think of decluttering 
as a project, something that we have to get done and then it's done. Then we can move forward with life, do the other things, live from this blissful state of clutterless homes. But if we are living a family life, an active life in our home, then decluttering needs to be a habit for us, not a project. Because you can deal with the stuff that's in your home right now, like just go whirlwind and take care of it all. Tomorrow, there's going to be more stuff. (laughs) People are going to get more stuff out and not because they're doing anything wrong, but because they're doing what they ought to be doing, learning, crafting, growing, playing, all of these things result in stuff. (laughs) I, you know, usually when I do any workshop like this, something happens where, uh, you know, God arranges it so that it's just born into me (laughs) what this is really all about. And so yesterday was a snow day. Out. There was no snow before. It's sunny today, but yesterday there was a lot of snow. It snowed all Sunday night and then it snowed Monday morning. And so, um, of course, the kids want the snow pants and the, all of the gloves, the gear, and all of that so they can go play in the snow, which is, you know, it's a special occasion here to have snow. So it was the right thing. It was getting a lot of stuff out and it made a mess and it meant bins being open and sorted. And then when they came in, it's dripping stuff. So we have to get towels and then today's the snow is gone. So we have to pack everything up again. But none of that, all of that work is cluttering up the place. And then it's the work of decluttering from all that stuff. But all of that is good work because the necessary, loving, right thing to do for the children was letting them, you know, giving them the materials they needed to have hours out of doors enjoying the snow. That was the right thing to do. So it doesn't matter that it made a mess or that stuff had to come out from storage and then it's going to have to just go back the next day. That's what it's for. And what I am part of what I am for in the home as a homemaker and mother is just doing doing that, arranging. And there's nothing I don't have to be frustrated about the fact that it's not worth it or whatever it is worth it. It's just, I might have wished there wasn't snow, but God sent snow. So out we go. And so that decluttering just comes and goes sometimes in ways we don't expect or can't predict and can't be ready for, like mentally prepared for. So we just got to run with it. But the decluttering, putting things back where they go, getting things out And putting things away is just a rhythm, something we can get used to. Um, So instead of thinking of decluttering as a project that's going to be done, checked off, accomplished, never to be done again, (laughs) we need to think of it as a habit, something that we're just going to get good at doing. Now, I don't remember what this slide says. (laughs) Um, habits start small and uh, the habit of decluttering is no different. So when I say that decluttering is a habit, it doesn't mean that we have to be clearing shelves and closets every day or spending the exact same time every day decluttering. It just means that we've accepted it as an ongoing, regular part of our day. Just like laundry ought to be a habit, and some people do it a little bit every day, maybe every other day, maybe one big day a week. These are all legitimate ways to stay on top of laundry. 
It's the exact same way with decluttering. There can be all kinds of ways to set it up. And um, just like laundry, it builds up. So we have to keep returning to doing it and um, spend the time decluttering. Now, to build a habit, you need a cue, a clear action that you're doing it, what the habit is, a reason for doing the habit, and a reward. And we're going to talk about the reward as C, but um, habits happen better when we... Um, have constructed all of the pieces instead of just thinking that they're going to happen on their own. So these pieces of a habit are drawn from Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, and then they're also explained in uh, B.J. Fogg's Tiny Habits and James Clear's Atomic Habits. Habits are big right now. And everyone talking about it <laughs> talks about these pieces that go into a habit. We tend to think only of the action part of a habit. And if we just repeat that action, that's a habit. But if we think about all the pieces that make a habit, we can build a habit that is more likely to stick and be helpful. So a cue for habits a, the, a cue for the decluttering habit might be a time or a day or a little pocket of time that you might have. Um, it might be while I'm waiting for my coffee. But you can find little spots in your day that you can do a small amount of decluttering. And when you know the reason why you are building this habit, then you're more likely to choose that habit when that cue comes. When it's not, when we feel like, you know, I'm never going to finish decluttering. I want to finish decluttering and I'm never going to finish. Then that goes back to the attitude piece, but we're never going to get motivated to get started if we don't think we're going to ever finish. And the key is not figuring out how we're going to get to finished. The key is remembering the reason why we declutter and um, the reason why small bits of decluttering count. They matter. They add up. And finishing is not what we're after. We're after building a habit. And again, the reward we'll talk about in a minute. When you have a habit of decluttering, which just means a small, like 10 minutes or less amount of decluttering a few times a week, you will then notice progress and momentum and traction in a way that we don't experience when we go kind of all out and have a big, you know, so we spend hours or a whole day decluttering and sometimes it feels good, sometimes it feels awful. But we just end up going right back to our old patterns and it usually doesn't last long. And then we're frustrated all over again, feel like we have to do it all over again. Whereas if we build decluttering as a habit, we aren't looking to just finish and be done and then life's going to be different. We are changing our actions and it's our actions that are different. The state, the state of our home will gradually improve as well, but what we're changing is our own patterns, not, you know, trying to magically transform our surroundings and think that change will happen in us based on our surroundings. We start with us and our actions, and that works itself out to our surroundings, not the other way around. That's the power of starting with habits instead of projects. And habits stick best when we start silly small. <laughs> like, I'm going to put three things away. 
I'm going to make a decision about two things every day. It's those kinds of choices that do build up, but they also make it silly to procrastinate. You know, who has time to start to spend all day decluttering? And you know, it's going to take at least all day, if not longer, to finish decluttering even one room. Instead of thinking about that as your goal, you're thinking about a lot of small pieces adding up over time. So you said, today I'm going to make a decision about two things. You do that, you win. It's a little bit of the celebration. It's a little sneak peek. But it doesn't, um, you know what? Let's just move on because we're getting to the next point. I first have this quote here from James Clear, his book, Atomic Habits. So you should be far more concerned with your current trajectory than your current results. And so with decluttering, we tend to think of the results. We have this picture, this image of what our home and our situation and our surroundings will be like if we finish decluttering. And that's our dream state. And then we never get there. And so we kind of start giving up. But instead of looking at what big picture results you're getting right now, we need to look at and build our trajectory. And that's, that starts small if it sticks. The, the big overhaul changes don't stick. They don't last. They don't make a trajectory. But small choices make a trajectory over time. The path that you are actually able to take each step along the way to move down that path instead of figuring out how to, you know, zoom forward or leap or, you know, what, where's the rocket pack that I can put on my back and it'll zoom me to the end. Instead, we're looking at the small step that we can do that will start moving us forward down the path and we'll get somewhere and it'll be better that way. So the third step, and this is the final part of every habit and our final, our C for the ABCs of decluttering is celebrate small wins. So yes, this is where we do talk about uh, the results, but it's different from thinking th that we are done, that we have now achieved the state of being decluttered. We'll never deviate. We'll never have a problem with this again. We've now achieved homemaking bliss and it's amazing and wonderful. If we are looking out for that as our win and we won't acknowledge any progress or good things along the way or before we get to that, we're never going to be happy because we're never actually going to achieve the state of homemaking bliss. <laughs> like, I hate to break it to you, <laughs> but that's not what it's about. It is about constant daily service to our family, which is going to have ups and downs. Stuff's going to come in and come out and life changes and throws you curveballs and all these things. And our goal is to walk in faithfulness, not achieve some kind of perfect state. So we're going to celebrate small wins along the way as we declutter. So when we celebrate, celebrating does not mean that you get chocolate every time you declutter. That's not the kind of reward. We aren't puppies. Um, sorry, I just saw my screen went blank. Um, <laughs> we are not puppies who need um, treats in order to do a trick. That's not the kind of reward or celebration we're talking about. Uh, for humans, virtue is its own reward. This is a sentiment that is ancient, 
not very well regarded or accepted or taught these days, but it's true. Virtue is its own reward. We are happier when we practice virtue. And Aristotle says, virtue is a habit. They're, they're the choices of action that we make. So maybe decluttering is a virtue. It's a good habit. It is a way of choosing to do the right thing with our stuff. So I don't know if it fits into prudence or temperance or justice maybe, but it is a choice that we can make and feel good about making. And that's the kind of celebration that we need is just to notice that we're doing the right thing and enjoy that. Not save any kind of enjoyment or celebration or happiness until we have achieved perfection and finished and checked off such that we'll never have to do it again. But instead, we are enjoying the fact that we have done, made the right choice, done some good right here, right now in this little way, that's enjoyable. That can give us a small taste of happiness and sometimes a small taste is all we need to take the next step and the next step. So I noticed this most of all when I was trying to learn the habit of making my bed, which I never made my bed as a child. And I was definitely on the side, you know, in the camp of why make your bed? You're just going to sleep in it again. This is stupid. Waste of time. I am proudly staking my flag in the will not waste my time making the bed thing. So, you know, fast forward 20 years or so, and everyone, it seems, says you should be making your bed. And it bugged me and I was putting it off. My husband would make his bed before getting into it at night, which was like mind blowing to me. And so, okay, well, if you're going to make the bed before you get into it at night, you've just defeated the whole purpose of not making the bed. I might as well make it in the morning. So at least it's done for a little bit longer. Anyway, I could not make it stick as a habit. And finally, I realized that um, every time I was making my bed, I was telling myself, well, this is a stupid waste of time, but I'm going to do it. And so finally, when I realized like maybe it's not sticking because I'm telling my like I'm reinforcing even I'm not reinforcing my action. I'm reinforcing my bad attitude about the action every time I do it. So I made the bed and then I stepped back. And just, you know what? That does make the room look nicer. You know what? The bed looks looks nice made. And I just took, you know, two seconds to observe that I had just put in order one particular small place and it did look nice. It did look better. And that's it. And making my bed has stuck. That was the missing piece was not... Uh, being persistent in reinforcing my own bad attitude, but instead choosing to notice the good. Hold on a minute, cough, I have a dry throat. So even with decluttering, you can take the time to notice, even if it's just you've put three things away on a shelf that has 20 things that don't belong. If you tackle three things, notice, pay attention, give yourself a little pat on the back. (laughs) It's a good work that you're going to keep persisting in and you're getting somewhere. Even if it's not finished or complete, you're not going for finished or complete. You're going for better. And if you go for better, Over the course of time, it'll get better and you'll get used to it. You'll get better at it. You'll get skilled in decluttering and it's not going to take you as much time. It's no longer going to be difficult to overcome your crankiness about having to do it. And uh, there's going to be less and less of it 
to do over time. Plus, when you do it just little bit by little bit, you also realize how much of a little bit it really is to just put the thing away <laughs> instead of setting it down, put it away. Um, do I really want to add this to my, I'm going to have to take care of this later, or am I just going to take care of it now? And because you're in that habit of taking a small step, you realize it's just a small step to put this where it belongs. And that's not a big deal. I'm someone who can take small steps that don't look, don't feel like it's a big deal. It adds up over time. And so I'm going to do that little bit now. And that is the way it works with the small wins. Persistence pays off in ways that we don't foresee at the beginning. There, there are domino effects down the line. And that's the way that habits work, especially linchpin habits. Habits of dealing with our stuff, whether that's making our bed or just putting the thing away instead of putting it down, persistence pays off over time. And uh, we need, for, for us to keep at that persistence, we need to notice those small wins. Uh, notice the before and after. Um we, when I was on Instagram, I did this. We called it Transformation Tuesday. It's just 10 minutes. Take a picture of a closet or a shelf or just someplace that needed some decluttering attention. And then set a timer for 10 minutes. Do as much as you could do in just 10 minutes, not longer. And then snap an after shot. And you can make a big difference in 10 minutes. And sometimes it feels like, oh, that's a big project. I'm going to procrastinate. But when you just say, you know, you set the timer for 10 minutes, you actually take that before and after so you can concretely see what you did accomplish. And then suddenly decluttering doesn't feel so overwhelming. It doesn't feel so unmanageable because you realize 10 minutes can do a lot in 10 minutes. You can get some real progress in 10 minutes. Even if it's just 10 minutes to really decide uh, what I need to do with this one particular thing. <laughs> that might be a 10 minute decision, but when you make it, like that's a huge, that's huge progress. But it's the taking action bit by bit over time that matters. We just need to recognize that decluttering means managing the stuff and managing the stuff is just a normal part of homemaking. It's, it's not a destination. It's not an end point that we're supposed to get to before we can be good at homemaking. It's just part and parcel of homemaking. Just like making the meals, just like doing the laundry, just like making the bed, decluttering is just a part of homemaking. And the more we practice it in small ways, the more that we're going to just accept it and the better we're going to get at it, the skill of it. And the more progress we're really going to see as we take those step-by-step -step pieces. So um, the other thing, I know that p many people mentioned this in the struggle section, and I think I've addressed it a little bit here, is that uh, the, the same areas get clutter again and again and again, right? So our, that's why we need to remember that our goal is not a finished, complete, done space. It's the process. It's it's the building the habit of just addressing it and doing it and accepting it as a part of our job. So when you have to declutter the same space over again, it doesn't mean that you've failed. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong or that it wasn't good enough decluttering or anything. The other people are messing you up. It just means you need to declutter that space again. And good thing you know how to declutter. 
Good thing you're used to that and good at that now, so you just do it. And the more you do it, the less time it takes. So uh, rotating in those spaces that just seem to be clutter magnets, yeah, you know, we just we can accept, you know what, I need to declutter this space at least every week, maybe even every day. And this is where the EHAP um, comes in. Uh, EHAP is our our family's like shorthand for tidying up, really, but it stands for everything has a place. And and so this is where that issue of clutter being things that aren't in their place. So if you EHAP, it means you're putting everything back in its place. So you're decluttering, right? You're putting things back in their places. And it doesn't work if everything does not have a place. So it's a little reminder to me too. Like they, other people can't deal with this stuff if I haven't given it a home. So we can't really tidy things up if things don't have homes. So that's a huge step that has to happen before we can effectively tidy up as a family. And that's a big part of the job of decluttering. But then once most things do have homes, then it's like, okay, well, you know what? The dining room table, the top of the dryer, the peninsula counter in the kitchen. These are areas that we're just going to have to e-hop every day. And we're just going to build e-hopping, which is like mini decluttering into our day every day. Do it together and get it done. And it's not a big deal that it attracts stuff because that is just normal and it's going to happen. The goal is not finished with decluttering. The goal is just making decluttering a normal part of life that we don't feel bad about anymore. And as we do that, we will experience the truth and live out the truth that we need to organize our attitude to organize our life. Our, our life being organized doesn't then allow us to have a good attitude. Having a good attitude about our life, about our responsibilities, about serving others is what allows us to move forward effectively with the stuff. And that's what we talk about a lot inside Simply Convivial Continuing Education. And we're going to spend all of February doing a declutter challenge. We did last year and it was one of the most popular things that we did inside membership. And so we're going to do a, a repeat of the decluttering challenge in February. And so we'll be tackling decluttering as a habit where it's not about accomplishing a certain amount. It is about building the habit and taking small steps. So the decluttering challenge happening in February, the challenge will be to declutter 20 times in the, the month. So it's not every single day, but it's, you know, most days in for 10 minutes. Each time is 10 minutes. And so it doesn't even, you know, you can do 20 minutes and that's two times in one day. But over the course of the month, taking 10 minute, taking decluttering in 10 minute chunks will add up. And we're going, there's a declutter challenge sheet that some of you have seen already. And if you complete that challenge sheet, every member who does complete it, gets a mailed prize. So I have uh, in the works, we're designing a new um, refrigerator magnet that says smile and start, which is one of our favorite mottos inside membership. So you get a smile and start magnet for your fridge. Every month in February to help people stay on board and keep at the decluttering, we're gonna, going to do 
uh, weekly live mentoring sessions that focus on decluttering and tackling our attitude about it and also just the nitty gritty um, details of getting it done. And every weekday, you can optionally sign up for daily texts that are going to deal with decluttering, either a reminder to declutter or a quote about decluttering or motivation to help you stick with it and keep at it. Just get a little text in the morning that will keep you, you know, in the game. So this is for members of Simply Convivial Continuing Education, and there's a green button down below that will um, take you to more information about membership. Um, Simply Convivial Continuing Education is the name of our membership, and it is for Christian homemakers who want to be faithful and fruitful in their homes and with their families where they want to be effective more than um, decorated and pretty. (laughs) Um, It is about not copying other people's plans, but figuring out what you need to do in your particular situation to be faithful and fruitful. So this month or in February, That is going to uh, primarily happen through decluttering as uh, members as a whole. We're going to be talking and doing decluttering all month and building the habit. So you can click the green button down below to learn more about membership. I'm pretty sure it'll open in a new window and won't stop the video. But now... Thank you so much for joining. This did take a little bit longer than I anticipated. I talked more than I meant to, but I don't want to skip out on your questions. So let me see here what we have as far as questions go. Um, I have probably five or so minutes and some of these I might be able to tackle in the replay I'm going to post the replay with a summary um, article and the slides. So um, some of these, like if I decide I'll be able to tackle it better in writing, that's what I'm going to do. All right. So making the time to put everything away the right way, that is a struggle for sure. And what we need to be careful of is having a a right way that's maybe unrealistic or too difficult. If we're having a hard time getting things put away, then one thing we can look at is how easy is it to get it put away? Or have I put too many steps between the mess and what cleaned up is supposed to look like? Um backsliding after the initial decluttering is done is also a struggle for sure. Um, and so some of that is that comes down to tackling decluttering as a habit, something we're going to keep doing. And it's just a part of our regular duties instead of thinking of it as a big project that then once we're done with, we're never going to have to do it again then it's frustrating when we do have to do it again. But if we recognize I'm going to have to do it again, then it's not a big deal when I do because I was expecting it. I had realistic expectations about the job itself. Um, how do you help kids declutter? My cluttery 10-year-old gets overwhelmed and says, I don't know, when asked to put things away or possibly get rid of them. Yes. Um, it's, and I, th- I mean, I think we can see this. Some people are just naturally good at it, but most of us experience this as adults too. So recognizing that it is um, something they're going to need help and support in doing. Because just like sometimes we do too. So it's too vague to say, decide about it to a child or have them create homes for things. They need help doing that. 
And so working alongside of them and with them to say, okay, um, this collection needs a home. Where should it live? Where would be a good place for it to live? And brainstorm with them. And maybe they can help just choose the place, but they can't start from scratch because it's, you know, it might be their room, but it's really your home and you're training them for adult life, but they aren't ready for it yet. And that's a big decision fatigue task to tackle is giving things a home. So it's it's something we can recognize is going to be draining and taxing for us as adults. And so it's only going to be like five or 10 times that for a child. So of course, they're feeling overwhelmed and saying they don't know. They need to be told where the home is and they need to know what good enough is. And that's just going to take practice and attention and direction and following through and checking up and doing it alongside. And, you know, after five or six or seven years of doing that with them, then you'll see some progress. But yeah, I have five kids ages eight to 17. And it's not like, okay, so in three months, then they're going to figure it out and they'll be able to be on their own, taking care of their room. All t- no, they, we are their parents helping them out for, you know, 17 or 18 years for a reason. It might take a little bit longer than a month or two. Um, should we declutter alone or with our family? Not a right answer to that one. It Sometimes there's a time for decluttering alone and a time for decluttering with others. Um, so let's see, Anna asks, how is decluttering distinct from EHAP? And it really isn't. Um, except for the fact that decluttering includes giving things a place. So you can't EHAP you, until everything does have a place. So if you have stuff that does not have a home, that does not have a place to belong, then the decluttering task is giving those places, giving those things a place, a home to live. Um, let's see. Carrie says, uh, if I'm not very religious, is your group for me? I am Catholic. And yes, we have Protestants and Catholics and a mix of ages and everything. And if you want to tackle homemaking in a way that is not just... Um, meaningless encouragement and like shallow, empty, rah-rah, but tactics and really digging into what the meaning and the purpose is. That's what we do inside Simply Convivial Continuing Education. It is um, our, you know, my, my approach and my encouragement is biblical and gospel focused. But, and then the, the work that we do is what needs to be done in our own homes. So um, I will get this posted as the replay with the slides and everything and email you all that follow up and you are free to then share it with anyone else you might know that would enjoy this little pep talk about decluttering. And I will see you around. Remember to click that green button down below. If you are interested in learning more about Simply Convivial Continuing Education and maybe participating in our February Declutter Challenge to really make decluttering a habit for you this year.